All right, John chapter number five. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of a lot of great doctrine in this chapter, and um, we see here a lot of controversial doctrine also is found in John chapter number five. And you'll see what I mean by that as we start getting into it. But we're going to start off here in John chapter 5. Um, the first point that I'm going to point out here is um, how the new versions in John chapter 5, there's an entire verse that's removed from the modern versions today. And it's verse number 4 of John chapter 5. We'll start reading there. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of, the impot of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the move moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And then Jesus has a, has a conversation basically with one of the people that's gathered at this pool. So, you know, here we have, there's this pool, right? There's this fountain of water. And it has these porches where people can sit. You know, I'm sure they're, like, they're probably like steps, right? Surround, kind of surrounding this pool. And there was a lot of people who were sick and impotent and had ailments and had all these problems that were gathered around this pool. And it's, it's, a, really, it's a really neat story because it's, it's just, um, it's very unique in the Bible. Just that there just happens to be this pool and it says that, uh, and this is a narr the narrator of the Bible saying this, right? So this isn't just some old wives' tale, right? This isn't some fable. This is saying that an angel went down at a certain season, an angel actually went into that pool and the people can see the water getting stirred. And, and after the water gets stirred, then the first person to enter into that water would recover from whatever their problem was. They're, they would physically be healed. And that's a, it's a really cool story. It's a really neat story. But what's really interesting is that verse 4 explains why is everybody, why are all these sick, impotent, lame people sitting around this fountain? Why is that? In, um, in the NIV, it's funny because it says, um, I'll read for you some verses here. It says, you could follow along, try to follow along in the King James while I read for you from the NIV. Starting in um, verse number one. It says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now, you know, for, I just want to stop there because, you know, doesn't the NIV just make things really simple? You know, it's really hard to understand, you know, this old archaic word, a porch. It's really hard to understand what a porch is, right, around, surrounding a fountain. But the colonnade, yeah, because everybody knows what a colonnade is. Right? Doesn't that make it just so much easier to understand? But that's what the people who promote the NIV would have you believe. Oh, yeah, it's so much easier. You know, there are these colonnades. What? What's a colonnade? I understand what a porch is. People have porches on their house. Anyways, we'll keep reading here. Verse number three. It says, Here a great number of disabled people used, used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. So it skips over all of verse 4 is just gone. It's just completely removed. And then, jumping down then to verse 7, he says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So this is the conversation that this, that this lame man is having with, with Jesus Christ. When Jesus asks him, you know, wilt thou be made whole? Well, the impotent man answers him. He's saying, well, look, there's nobody here to help me get into that water because before I can even get into that water, someone else comes down. Now, this story makes absolutely no sense in the NIV. Why are these, why are these people just sitting around this fountain of water? For what purpose? Why is he even saying to Jesus Christ that there's nobody here to help me get into this water? If you're reading the NIV, you have no idea why because that verse, the whole verse that explains exactly why all of this is happening, it gives you the entire context for this story, is just completely removed. You have no idea that the first person that steps into that water is going to be made whole, is going to be healed. And that, you know, that, to me, that's a pretty important aspect to this story. 
But they just yank it out. You know, it goes verse 3, verse 5. Or actually, in, in the, the version that I got online, it says verse 3, verse 4 in brackets, verse 5. And in verse 4 in brackets, you have to go find it somewhere else on the page of you know, them casting it out and saying, well, some manuscripts say this, and they'll give you know, their version of that verse. But um, it's just another one of those things. It's ridiculous to me. And it, to me, it's just kind of funny, like, why is the guy wanting to get into water in the first place? Well, if you're reading NIV, you have no idea what, what, what he's doing. But um, let's keep reading here because Jesus talks to this guy. Now, here's a guy for 38 years. He's had this ailment. He's been impotent. He's, he's had this, this problem for 38 years. And it says, When Jesus saw him lie, verse 6, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? He's like, Do you want to be made well? That's what he's asking. Wilt thou? Is that what you want? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am cutting, another steppeth down before me. So he's explaining, like, look, I'm, I want to get healed. That's why I'm here. You know, he's waiting, just waiting for the water to be troubled, but every time it happens, he's been there, someone else gets down there first. And it's only apparently the first person that gets in there after the water's troubled that gets healed. Then the water's just back to normal again. And um, so Jesus answers him here in verse 8. It says, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. So this is going to be kind of a big aspect of this chapter here. And it's also a big aspect all throughout the Bible with Jesus healing people, and especially with him healing people on the Sabbath. This is a problem that the Jews had with Jesus Christ, that the Pharisees had with Jesus Christ, was his doing this, um, this work on the Sabbath of, of healing somebody. Now, well, we have to remember, first of all, would Jesus ever command somebody to sin? Because what, what he did here was an imperative statement, right? It wasn't a suggestion. He wasn't asking him. He said, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. That is, that is an imperative statement. I mean, it's a command. It's something that he told him to do, right? So if Jesus is telling him to do something, is Jesus going to say something to you like, you know, eat this food sacrificed unto an idol? He wouldn't do that. That would be a sin, right? I mean, he's not going to tell you to do something that isn't right. So he tells this man, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And it was a Sabbath day, and it says, and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was Sabbath, verse 10, says, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, the first thing I would say here is that they're not understanding the scripture and what you were and were not allowed to do. Um, because if that was a sin for that man to be carrying his bed home for, you know, when Jesus told him to do that, Jesus wouldn't have told him to do that. Um, when Jesus said, rise, take up that bed and walk, no part of that was a sin. Now let's keep reading. It says um, in verse number 11, he answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. So he's saying like, look, this guy just healed me and told me to take up my bed and walk. That's why I'm walking with my bed. You know, like, obviously you're going you're gonna to give respect. You're going to listen to the person. You've been, you've been injured or debilitated for 38 years. You've been impotent for 38 years. This guy comes. He's able to heal you. And he says, take up your bed and go home. He's like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Because, I mean, obviously he just healed him. And obviously he's of God being able to perform such a miracle like that. And... Um, so then the Jews, they ask him, it says in verse number 12, then they ask they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? So they want to find out, who is this guy? What, you know, who are you talking about? Verse 13, and he that was healed wist not who it was. It means he didn't know who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So basically Jesus comes up to this guy and he's saying, hey, do you want to be healed? And the guy just says, look, you know, like basically, yeah, you know, no one's here to, to help me down into the water. Jesus heals him. He says, take up that bed, rise, take up that bed and walk. And then he just, he just leaves. You know, he's, there's a lot of people in that area and he, just, he just, just keeps going, right? He's got a lot of work to do. And um, so this guy didn't even know who it was. He just, I mean, this guy came, all of a sudden he says, rise, take up the bed and walk. He takes up his bed. It's like, cool, you know, he's healed. And Jesus is already gone. And um, it says in verse 14, afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, behold, 
Thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, um, real quickly, I think we could gather from this. Again, I'm not going to say 100% for sure, but it, it looks to me, it appears to me that when he says, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto me, the reason why he was impotent to, the be to begin with is probably wasn't from birth. He's probably older than 38 years old. You know, but he's had this injury for a long time. It's probably a result of something that he did that was sinful in his life. Um, and Jesus said, look, okay, now you're made whole, right? I've had mercy on you. I healed you. He says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Now, this is something that, that we need to... Um, <laughs> You got to be careful when you're applying scripture. We know all throughout scripture that when people get healed, it's a it's a um, symbolic of salvation, right? We see in the Bible when people had the faith to be healed, and Jesus going around, he's doing these these miracles, and and they get healed of their plagues. You can't. You got to be careful with these illustrations and with parables and with these examples that you don't take them too far and just and just twist them in and interpret them the wrong way. Now, just because Jesus said, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee, this isn't referring to someone being able to lose their salvation. Be like, oh, well, see, Jesus was made him whole, but then, but then he can go out and, and something worse will even happen and apply that to, to the spiritual realm. No. What he said here is absolutely right. Now, after you get saved, I think we could still follow this rule of sin no more. The Bible, you know, God has his commandments for a reason. Just because you are forgiven of your sins eternally for as far as not having to pay that eternal punishment does not mean that you should just go live a life of sin and just go out and do whatever you want. We should sin no more. And if we've, if we've had some problems in our life, you know, where we've had, um, I could think of myself personally, where, um, you know, with, with trouble I've gotten into with the law with, with DUIs and such, and I feel that, that God has extended a lot of mercy on me. There was a point where I got pulled over for a DUI and I got, and I got a ticket for it and everything that before it got into the court, you know, I had made a decision that night. I just said, God, you know, I'm sorry. That had nothing to do with anyone else. I just said, God, I'm sorry. And from that night, I never touched alcohol again. I just, it was something that had to happen to me. It was a point that I had to get to where I just said, I'm done. I'm done, and I made a vow and I promised God I will, not, I will not drink another drop of alcohol for the rest of my life. And I've stayed true that I promise now. And um, it's, it's kind of weird. You know, I, I can't say 100% for sure again, but I believe that God showed mercy on me. That, that ticket ended up getting dropped. There was some just paperwork got shuffled and, and it just went away. Now, Again, I, I think that God was ending up showing mercy on me for the decision I made and for just kind of getting right with him. And it was from that moment I started, you know, getting more and more closer to God and, and trying to do the right thing. But it was a point that I had to get to. But I'll tell you this. If I go back to that, if I go back on my promise, if I do start drinking again, a worse thing, I guarantee you a worse thing is going to come unto me. It's not just going to be, you know, some trouble with a ticket or paying a fine or maybe spending a night in jail. It's going to be a lot worse than that. God's going to bring his judgment on me and say, look, okay, okay, I've shown mercy on you. Now sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. And I think that's what he's teaching us here. Like, you know, we go to God, we ask him for mercy, we ask him to help us, you know, whether it be healing with, with some issues that we're having, whatever it may be. And especially when it's a result of our sin, when we get into trouble because of our sin, he says, okay, look, I'll help you out this time, but, but don't get caught doing it again. And you can think the same way with our children. You know, when your children, they, they screw up, they get themselves in the, in the hot water, they get themselves into trouble for things they shouldn't have been doing, for things that they were doing, breaking your rules. You might extend some mercy on them that one time, but I'll tell you what, they go out and do that same thing again. It's going to be a lot worse the next time. And I think that's the, the teaching that we can take from this verse. It has nothing to do with, you know, losing someone's salvation or anything like that. It's a very practical statement, though, that we all ought to take heed to. Hey, look, don't sin anymore, especially when God shows mercy on you and God extends that to you. Don't just go and, um, and continue sinning and just, and just be that disrespectful to God for helping you out in your time of need. Let's keep reading here. Verse 15. 
The Bible says the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. So he didn't know at first when they asked him. Then Jesus came back to him and said, okay, you know, you're whole. Don't, you know, go and sin no more. And that's when he found out that it was Jesus. So he goes back and he tells the Jews it's Jesus. And then um, on verse, six, verse 16 says, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So this makes the Jews really, really angry, really upset with him that they're, really, they're looking to kill him because he did this on the Sabbath day. That was their big thing. And you remember there were certain things there are certain aspects of the law that the Jews really just like clung to and they kind of made them out to be more than they were and they added, you know, the, um, the, the doctrines of men, like the commandments of men as the doctrines of God. They kind of added to God's, to God's word and they kind of changed it. But um, this was one of the big things that they, that they really persecuted Jesus over were the things that he did on the Sabbath day. Now, and then in verse 17, Jesus responds to them and to their, you know, to them persecuting himself. He says, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Now, this is a very important statement. We're, we're going to pause on this for a little while. But, um, you know, it, we first have to understand that the Bible says that Jesus was without sin. Okay, in 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 22, the Bible says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Referring to Jesus Christ, he did no sin. And again, in Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ was perfectly sinless. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because here we see, what were they mad at Jesus about for working on the Sabbath day, right? And what did Jesus respond to them with? He says, My Father worketh, to, worketh hitherto, and I work. Did Jesus say, I'm not working? He didn't. Now, are you supposed to work on the Sabbath day? No. By the law, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, but we're, I'm going to show you why it was lawful, it was okay for Jesus to do it. It's basically because he was the son of God. Okay? Jesus Christ, it says here, he answered them and says, I work. Now, Jesus was without sin. And we're going to look at a lot of verses, and hopefully this will... This will clear it up for you. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter number 6. And look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another, what they might do to Jesus. This, made, this infuriated them. They could not believe that he was doing this stuff. And it's important to note, there's a couple things, because he asked an important question. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? So what he's teaching them here is that even though he may be working in a sense, like in healing, that was not against the commandment of the Sabbath. You know, to heal somebody, to do good unto somebody in that regard is not, it's not breaking the Sabbath. We're going to look at some more scriptures. Jump, flip back right back to verse number one of Luke 6. It says, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the corn fields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself was in hunger, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone? And he saith, said unto them, 
that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So now we see again, and, and you'll see over and over again, we're going to turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 2, but, um, or no, sorry, Luke 13 is where we're going to go next. Basically, they were really hung up on this notion of the Sabbath, but they didn't understand it. One, they weren't saved. They didn't have discernment of the Bible. And that's why Jesus says in his verse, have you not read? Saying like, didn't you read the scripture? Didn't you read the Bible? I mean, you're coming at me saying, oh yeah, you guys are breaking the Sabbath day. What do you mean? What are you doing? That's not lawful to do on the Sabbath days. They have no understanding of the law itself, of the Sabbath day, and why it was instituted to begin with. And, and what the law even meant and how they would be um, obeying or not obeying it and how there were situations where it would be acceptable like he gave here with David when he was with his men and they gave him the showbread. He gave that example of that being acceptable even though that it wasn't lawful, you know, the way that God designed it, it wasn't lawful for him to do that. When it comes to, to saving life and, and people just need to eat or whatever, you know, like they were, they were, they needed to eat the ears of corn, but it was a Sabbath day and geez, they're doing the Lord's work. They're doing God's work. They're going out and preaching the gospel. They're following God and obeying God. And if they need to eat, they need to eat. And God knows that. And he's saying that, look, this is okay. He's saying this is acceptable. And um, in verse in Mark 2, you don't have to turn to Mark 2.27 says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He's saying, look, God didn't create you just for this Sabbath day, just so this Sabbath day can be holy. He's saying the Sabbath was made for you to give you a day of rest. It's not the other way around. And he says, this, therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also the Sabbath. Jesus Christ was Lord of the Sabbath day. He came to do the work, which is another illustration that, you know, we have rest in Jesus Christ, which is what that illustration of the Sabbath is. That is the day where you were, you know, especially the children of Israel, they relied on God and um, they ceased from their own works which is what we need to do for salvation. But the reason why we, can, we, we cease from our works and trust on Christ is because He did the works. So on the day that man is resting, on the day that man is breaking from his works, Jesus Christ is doing the work. He's doing the work for us. He is Lord of the Sabbath and doing those things because that is the day that we're not supposed to work. You know, we weren't supposed to work. Um, today that, that restriction has been removed. We don't follow the Sabbath the way they did in the Old Testament. <coughs> but that's what the illustration was. Just like when Jesus Christ died on the cross for those three days and three nights that he was in the grave, that he was in hell paying for our sins, those three days were all days, Sabbath days. The first, second, and third day that he was buried, that he was in, in hell, were all holy days. Were all Sabbath days where people were not supposed to be doing any work. He was doing all the work for us. You're in Luke chapter 13. Let's look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, again, here we see their big problem, Jesus healed. And this is, this is what's so ridiculous with these Pharisees. You know, here is a man from God healing people. And not like these jokers who call themselves faith healers that are slapping people in the forehead and knocking them down on the ground and they're not any more whole than they were when, before they got there. Jesus Christ is literally performing miracles. Miracles that no man has the power to do on his own of making people whole the way that he did. A power given him by God, through God. Here's a man of God healing people, making people whole, making them better, and these people are enraged because he's doing it on the Sabbath day. People who had infirmities, 38 years, 38 years this guy's in this condition. Jesus is walking around, he's doing his work, he's got a lot of stuff to do. He heals them on the Sabbath day and they're ready to kill him because he healed a man that was, that was impotent for 38 years of his life. That shows just the, the, the madness of, of, of how much these people were, were clinging to their doctrine and the commandments of men more than they, that they, they put their faith and trust into God and even understanding what the commandments are for, what it's all about and the spirit of the commandments 
more than just themselves getting so hung up on the letter, which they didn't even understand that. But um, we're in verse 14. It says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? He's saying, You hypocrite, you people that own animals, you own livestock, are you just going to let them die because they can't get a drink of water? Aren't you going to you know, loose them and bring them out to the watering hole, get some water and then come back so that your livestock doesn't die? He's like, of course you do that. And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? He's saying, you do, the, you do the same thing with your animals, you hypocrite. And you're going to judge them saying, oh, you shouldn't be healed on the Sabbath day when a man of God is coming and healing people through the power of God. And, and you know, people were, were, you know, he says, Satan hath bound this woman for 18 years and he just came and healed her and they want to kill him for that. Their, their motivation is all screwed up. Um, turn, if you would, then to John chapter number 7. We're going to see one more point about the, about the Sabbath before going back to John 5. John 7, verse 21. It says, the Bible reads, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that was their problem with the law, with the law of the Sabbath day, is they weren't judging righteous judgment. It would be the same thing with David. That's why he gave the example of the showbread. Hey, they needed to eat. They had just made this journey real quick it was a far journey. They needed some food, basically to survive. They needed food. So yeah, under all normal circumstances, you know that food is holy. It's not for them to eat. But are you going to save life? Yes. That's where God is putting the emphasis on saving life, on these things that matter most. He's saying, you know, on the Sabbath day, you're going to go and circumcise a child. You're taking a piece of flesh away from a person so that you can keep that law. Well, you're doing work to do that, aren't you? Is basically what he's saying. And he's saying, you're going to do that, and you're okay with that. But if I come, and instead of removing flesh, I just make them whole, I just make them better. Now you have a problem with that, and you're going to say, I'm breaking the Sabbath day? They're hypocrites. They didn't understand. They have no discernment because they weren't saved. And um, that's why when we see here um, in John chapter 5, was Jesus doing work? Yes. But was he breaking the Sabbath? No. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath. He was doing that which was still lawful. And, um, and he was Lord of the Sabbath anyways. But um, look at the next verse here. Now we're back in John chapter 5. So verse 17 says, Jesus answered them, basically just saying, My father worketh hitherto and I work. Right? That was his answer to him. Which in, this infuriated him twofold. Verse 18, it says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath. So they're saying, that was bad enough. In his response, saying, look, that he's working on the Sabbath, it says, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, this is something that they did good right. That by, when Jesus Christ, saying that he was the Son of God, made him equal with, with God the Father. This is something that, that many of the, the false religions today, they don't understand. They don't get it right. Because they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. He wasn't God in the flesh. He was just the Son of God. And, and they just treat that as just a lesser thing. No, the Jews understand when you say he was the Son of God, that, that literally made himself equal to God. That put him on the same ground, the same standing as God, being begotten of the Father God. See, 
spiritually were born again, right? But Jesus Christ was physically begotten of the Father. And, um, and He is equal with God. He is co-equal with God the Father. Um, we know that, that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three being one, He was equal with God. He is equal with God. But um, that infuriated the Jews because they didn't think that that was possible. They, they, they didn't like that. And they wanted to kill him for it. Look, let's keep reading here. Verse number 19. It says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Verse number 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Again, this is going into some, some real controversial doctrine here about Jesus Christ and essentially about the deity of Jesus Christ. John chapter 5 is a great chapter to prove the deity of Christ. That's what we're getting into with verse 18 is to make himself equal with God. Of course he was making himself equal with God and Jesus Christ out of his own mouth is explaining that because he's saying whatsoever things that God the Father does, he's saying the Son does also. He says, I do all the things that my Father done. He showed me these things and that's exactly what I'm doing. Verse 21 says that he has the, you know, God the Father has, um, basically he has the power to raise people up from the dead, which no man on earth has the power to do that. God the Father has power to raise people up from the dead and quickeneth them. Quickeneth means just to make them alive. And um, it says, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Jesus Christ has that full power and authority for whoever he wants to quicken them and raise them up from the dead. You remember he did that for Lazarus. He made Lazarus arise and, and, and come back to life. Proving that he was who he said he was. He's, and that's what the, the whole point where we we'll get to that in a little while. The Bible says in verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Again, you know, Jesus Christ, with, with all of these words, and that's why, you know, you have to make a choice. Is Jesus Christ either the biggest blasphemer, liar, you know, um, that has ever walked this earth with all these claims that he's making, or was he truly the Son of God? Now, unfortunately, for a lot of people at that time, they made the wrong choice. And that's why they hated him so much and wanted to kill him, because they thought that everything he's saying here, he's just totally blaspheming God and is against everything that God taught. But, I mean, this goes against the Ten Commandments when, when God says that, that you should have no God before me, and that, you know, God gets all of our honor, he gets our respect. Jesus is saying, look, if you don't honor the Son, you're not honoring the Father. And that's what he's saying. You need to honor the Son the same way that you honor the Father. He's not saying that the, the Father gets any more honor than the Son does. Again, making himself equal with God. It's exactly what he's doing. And it's coming out of his own mouth. It's not just other people. It's not the Apostle Paul. And that's what a lot of people try to do these days too. They'll try to tell you, oh, no, 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 no. The deity of Christ, he, Jesus never claimed that. That's just something that his followers just embellished later on and, and you know made up all of this extra stuff after Jesus was already dead. That's what they'll have you to believe, but that's false. Out of Jesus Christ's own mouth, he's saying here that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now, I'm not going to say that to you today that, hey, honor me the same way that you honor God. Absolutely not. That would be blasphemous because I am just a mortal man. I am just flesh. I am just blood. I am just, I am not the Son of God. I'm not the begotten of the Father that Jesus Christ was. Um, but he deserved that being God manifest in the flesh. So that's why he deserved that um, honor as much as the Father. But again, you can see how this would infuriate these people because they didn't believe that. They didn't believe he was the Christ. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Son of God because the Son of God is equal with God. And they didn't believe that. 
Verse number 24. My favorite verse in probably an entire Bible. I use this every time out soul winning. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And the reason I'm going to go over this real briefly, I can't remember if I covered it. I don't feel like I covered it well enough on Sunday night or on Sunday morning when I did the soul winning. But um, if I could only get one or two verses out sometimes when I'm talking to people, this is, this is usually one of them. If, if someone just really isn't that interested or they, they don't have very much time, this encapsulates salvation just like John 3.16 does. John 3.16 is another great verse that if I don't have very much time, I'll use that one. Um, there's only a few verses that I've really just, just, just packed so much doctrine into it. Jesus Christ says right here that you need God's word to be saved. He says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That word hath is present tense. It means you have it. It's everlasting. It's going to last forever. If it doesn't last forever for any re reason whatsoever, then Jesus Christ is a liar. He says, You have everlasting life and you shall not come into condemnation. Oh, unless you kill somebody. No, that's not what the Bible says. Oh, unless you turn your back on God. No, that's not what the Bible says. He says, you have everlasting life. It lasts forever. You shall not come into condemnation. He says, hey, you've passed from death unto life. It's a one-time event that happens. And this is totally in context. We're getting the context tonight that Jesus Christ is preaching these things so that they might be saved. We see he's explaining who he is. He's the son of God. Hey, I have power to, to, to quickeneth whom I will. He's explaining this to him. I have that power. I, the Father has committed unto me, Jesus Christ. He's committed unto me all judgment is what he's explaining to them. Hey, I'm the judge. I have power to, to make alive. Anybody that believes on me or on him that sent me, he says, you have everlasting life and you're saved forever. You shall not come into condemnation. Verse 25 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. People who are, who are dead, the dead he's referring to here, are those that are dead in their sins. Those that are not saved. They're hearing the words of life. They're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're dead, they could, but they could hear what he's saying. And he said, those that hear, so those that hear and receive it, basically, that they actually hear and understand and believe, and they that hear shall live. Verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Again, we see that, that he's given that authority. Verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now I'm going to spend the majority of the rest of the sermon on this point because this is an important point and I don't want you to get tripped up on this or have this be confusing to you or, or have someone else come and try to throw this in your face as a, as a foundation for a works-based salvation. Um, it can, I could see how it could be a little bit confusing, but I'm going to show you a few passages to help explain this. Um, so again, what, it, what he says here, verse 29 is what I'm focusing on. It says, And shall come forth they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So you think they're, you know, people look at that and it's confusing because you say, well, wait, I didn't think that our salvation is based on what we do, right? So how does this make sense? Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to make it a little bit clearer for you tonight. Now, the first thing I want to point out before we even get into the explanation of this verse, right? There are mountains of evidence in the Bible explaining it's not of works, it's not how good we are, it's a free gift, it's everlasting. You know, all these other concepts in the Bible teaching about salvation, right? Teaching us that we're by saved by grace. Now we're all tons and tons of verses. When you come across a verse like this and you see this, okay, don't let this shake your faith in God's word or in the Bible because it may look to be like something else or a contradiction. 
Now we know that God's word has no, if God's word is contradiction, it's not God's word. God doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. He doesn't say one thing and do another. God's word is going to, if it's truly God's word, it's going to be perfect. Okay. And when you come across some things, you just might not completely understand it. Or have a full grasp. Well, what is he talking about here? And that's fine. But, um, but, but try not to let it shake you. But we're going to dig into this a little bit further. Um, Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter number 3. Because 1 John chapter 3 is another portion of Scripture that, that is also misunderstood. And you can get these things um, confused and mixed up, but actually they, they you know, you kind of got to understand multiple parts of the Bible here and multiple parts of Scripture to really get a full understanding of what he's talking about here. Um, 1 John chapter 3, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. I'm going to take a break here real quick just to point out that it says... Um, in verse 2, is, is, I forgot to, to mention this, it says that, um, but we know that when he shall appear, so when Jesus Christ comes back, right? So this is talking about the resurrection. And that's what we're, the context that we were talking about in John chapter 5, this is what was the resurrection, right? Um, the resurrection, those that have done good, um, the resurrection of life, and they have done evil, and the resurrection of damnation. So, um, so let's keep reading here. It says, in verse 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So this is a very, very similar. This is going to help us understand this. And again, in, you have to read these things in context. In, in John chapter 5, he just got done explaining about eternal security and it's whosoever believeth, right? And, and just in verse 24, right before he gets to verse 29, he, he establishes that foundation. In 1 John chapter 1, it tells us in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He makes you know, make sure to, to bring that up in the beginning. Because there's two different concepts that we're dealing with here. right? It's the same way that there's two different concepts of being saved from your sins. I'll bring up this point. When, when you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, are you ever going to go to hell? No. When you put your faith on Him, you're saved. That's the eternal judgment for your sin, right? That's God's punishment for our sins is hell. But is that the only punishment for our sins? No. Because God can judge us in this lifetime also. So, Christ's shed blood will forgive that debt that you owe of the punishment of hell. But if we continue to sin, yes, that still covers our debt of hell that we owe to God. But that doesn't mean that God's not going to punishment, punish us in this lifetime because of our sins. So to say that you could, you know, and people, have, I've heard this argument before. And it's, I don't believe it's sound. It's not a sound argument because people say, oh, well, I thought you were forgiven of your sins, right? Well, how can God do anything against you after you believe, even though you continue to sin? How can he do anything against you? Because you're forgiven of all of your sins. You're forgiven of that, that eternal judgment, 
That's what you're forgiving them. But he corrects us and disciplines us as children in this lifetime when we break his law and when we sin, yes. But it's not the same thing that we're talking about. What Jesus' atonement did for us isn't the same as, as God correcting us. If that makes sense. Hopefully, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. So, we're, te we're talking about a couple different things. Now, when you're, when you're saved, there's what's called the new man. When we're born again, the Bible talks about our spirit quickening, right? We're all born body, soul, and spirit into this world, okay? Obviously, we know what the body is, our flesh. We have a soul and a spirit. When we commit sin, when we come to the age where we can understand sin, know what it is, and we, and we, and we commit sin against God, our spirit dies within us. But the spirit is still there. It's just dead. It's, just, it's still in us. Okay? And the soul is always there. The soul isn't dying. The soul is just there. And, and we all have a soul as well, right? The soul guides us and, and that's, you know, we make decisions and everything. Now, when you get saved, that spirit that was dead because of sin is now alive. And that's what, you know, when, when we're looking at life, oftentimes, you know, everlasting life, it's that spiritual life that we're referring to. Obviously, when you say you have everlasting life, people say, oh, and I like to ask this question at the door, if you have everlasting life, are you ever going to die? Well, no, not if you have everlasting life. That's life that lasts forever. Of course, by definition, that's what it is. Well, physically, we are going to pass away. But the life is in our spirit. So you're either dead or alive. That's a, a spiritual basis and understanding. Physically, you can, be, you can be dead or alive as well. But we need to understand from the context what the Bible is referring to when it uses these words. Like everlasting life, it's not talking about our physical bodies living forever. We're going to get new bodies. Again, taking the whole Bible as a whole, we get that, we understand that, that later we are going to get new bodies. But it's our spirit that's revived. It's our spirit that that receive that that you know becomes eternal, um, that that is that is brought alive eternally, and um, so we see here that new creature that's inside us, that new spirit that's brought to life, that doesn't sin. That's the new man because that's begotten of God. When we're born again and we become God's children, it's it's God's seed, God's word taking root in us. And, and when we're, we're born again, that is a pure seed. That is of God. That's why we have a dichotomy within ourselves, because that new spirit is of God. That's why we are the children of God, because we have that spirit within us that is born of God. Yet we still have a sinful flesh causing us to sin, so we have this battle and this struggle going on. And 1 John chapter 3 is explaining this, where he says in verse 4, Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is it's defining sin for us, and sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Again, talking about Jesus Christ, in him is no sin. Jesus Christ has no sin. And um, he's taking away our sins. That's what makes us pure. He's come and is, is literally all of our sins. Which means he's taken those away. He's nailed them to his cross. He has paid for them. We don't have that sin anymore when God's looking at us in this sense, in this spiritual sense. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And this is where we get this doctrine from that that new man, that new creature, that new spirit doesn't sin because it's abiding in Christ. Our new spirit is Christ in us. Christ is in our spirit, and it, and it says, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So it's when it's talking about there is, again, being born of God, being born of that spirit. The spirit does not commit sin. That's the new man. The Bible says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not obey the lusts of the flesh. When we're walking in that spirit, we don't sin because the spirit doesn't sin. 
That makes sense. That's, that's because it's born of God. And that's not born of the devil. People who are children of the devil, their spirit is dead. Okay, then it's not coming back to life. If they're a child of the devil, if they've gone that route, it's not going to be, they're the walking, you know, they're the undead. Right? They could be the, the, the zombies or whatever <laughs> of this world. But um, the Bible, when the Bible says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and this is why. So it goes on to say, verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him. The seed, God's, God's word remains in you. That seed that brought forth that life, God's perfect, sinless, righteous, life-giving seed is inside of you. His seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So, we're going to turn to one more, one more section to ex help explain this. And that's um, Romans chapter 8. And then I'll point this out too. I forgot this was on the next page of my notes. But in, um, you could just keep going to Romans 8. In verse 14, it's, it's, it's real interesting. You can compare the books of you know, the Gospel of John as well as the Epistles of John. And because it's coming from, they're, both, they're all coming from John, it's the same style. You know, they're God's words, but God has used, man, and you'll notice the different writing styles and the different subjects that they, that they talk about. God has, has divinely used these men to, to, to pen down his words, but they still kind of have that, that uniqueness to each of them. And in John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, 14, we see, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Remember, we saw that in John 5, 24. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He's saying that's how we know it. When we do good works, when we help people out, hey, that's one way that we know that we have passed from life unto death because we're doing that righteousness that is within us. When we do the righteousness, when we do the good works, we for ourselves can know that um, we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He says, He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his, his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Um, all of that's talking about the inner man, which is exactly what I believe that John chapter 5 is talking about in that verse. But we're in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. Because these can be difficult verses to understand and to get down. Um, and I just pray that God will just give me that... that speech to make it a little bit more clear. Verse number one says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he says, has made me free from that law of sin and death. You're, is no longer bound by that law, which is why we don't go to hell. Right? Obviously, we're, we're freed from that law of sin and death by God's law of, of the spirit of life. Verse number three, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, flesh and for sin condemned sin in, in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Again, he's bringing up that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that we have within us, that new creature, that new Spirit. It's important to discern this and understand. It says in verse number 8, or in verse um, number 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Um, so what he's saying here, that you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if you're saved, you know that the spirit of God dwells in you. You have received the Holy Spirit. That comes at salvation. He's saying those that are in the flesh, they cannot please God. If you can't please God in the flesh, you're not going to have any righteousness. It's going to be those in, in, back in John chapter 5 that do evil. Right? This is what he's referring to, those that do evil. You're not pleasing God in the flesh. Um, it says, But he's saying you are not in the flesh. Even though physically, yes, we still do have this flesh, but he's saying you are not in the flesh. But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Of course, if you don't, if you're not saved, if you haven't received God's Spirit, then you are not his. You are not his child. You're not his son. And if Christ be in you, he says, the body is dead because of sin. So yes, he's acknowledging, you know, we still do have this body, and this body is dead because of our sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, because of his righteousness that gets imputed unto us. So it says, they that have done righteousness unto life eternal, the, you know, the resurrection, John 5 is what I'm trying to explain here. We have that righteousness by virtue of having the Holy Spirit inside of us, by having the new man inside of us. That is the righteousness that we have and that we have done and that God is going to look at to be considered part of the resurrection unto life eternal. It's that righteousness that, that we could glean from, from all these other passages versus those that do evil, that are in the flesh, that do not have Christ dwelling in them, um, that cannot please God because they're in the flesh. It says um, in verse number 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So he's saying, look, if, again, if you're saved, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, if you have that spirit, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit. Again, referring to the resurrection. The resurrection is when we receive that new body. That's when we receive that, the, you know, if we're still alive, our body is going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This old sinful flesh is just going to be, boom, brand new body. And if we were dead, if our body's in the grave and our soul is spirit up in heaven, hey, our body is going to be raised up again from the dead, but a new body that's going to be reunited with our soul and spirit. And um, that's what he's referring to, saying, look, if you have that spirit, that's what's going to happen to you. And the reason why that's going to happen, the reason why your dead body is going to be quickened, he says, because by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It's his right, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's that's what, what gives us that life. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Um, hopefully, you know, look at that, look into that later tonight, but it still isn't quite making sense with John chapter 5. I'm sorry, that's the best I could do. Um, look at 1 John chapter 3, look at Romans chapter 8, and, and read Romans, I'm kind of stopping there because I need to continue on with the sermon, but Romans 8, I mean, the entire chapter is great. It, it really digs into this, into this doctrine. Um, and like I said, I could understand where people could get confused from it, but it, it, there's, it, it shouldn't have to be that way. Um, in context and in light of all the rest of the scripture um, this isn't just talking about our good works that save us unto life or unto damnation um, because Jesus said again I mean it, earlier in verse 24 it says you shall, if you believe you shall not come into condemnation so how could you 
be part of the resurrection of damnation if you believe. It's impossible. It can't be done. And that's why he, he made a point to say that first before getting into they have done good versus they have done evil. Verse number 30. Let's keep going from that point. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And that's the will that we all should be seeking, is the will of God the Father, not our own will. Um, there's a great example that Jesus was given for us. And if you want to have uh, righteous judgment in, in the way that you judge things, it should be focused on what the will of the Father is. If you can always keep, well, what's God's will in this? What does God's word say? That's where we're going to get righteous judgment from. Verse 31, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. Again, these things, he's saying, these things I say that you might be saved. Everything he's saying here is in context of salvation, which is one of the reasons, again, I use John 5, 24, when we're going out and giving the gospel. Um, Jesus Christ was saying these things that you might be saved. Verse 35, he was a burning and shining light, talking about John the Baptist. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness, that the same works that I do, excuse me, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now, here we see Jesus Christ saying that he is a greater witness than that of John. And the reason why his witness is so much greater. He says, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So the, 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 the works that Jesus were doing were a lot greater and mightier in power than what John the Baptist was doing. Now, Jesus Christ himself said that there hath not arisen, you know, among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Great man of God. But you know what John the Baptist wasn't doing? He wasn't going around healing people and, and doing all these miracles. He was a great preacher, a preacher of righteousness. Yes, absolutely. And he wrought great truth and had a great ministry. But Jesus Christ obviously is way, way greater than John the Baptist. And the works that, that he had to do, that Jesus Christ had to do, those very works that he did bear witness of who he was. They proved Jesus Christ that he was the Christ walking in the flesh and that God had sent him. You can't look at somebody doing all of the works that he did, speaking all the righteousness that he spoke, and say that he's not from God. He says, the work that I did proves it. You can look at my fruits. And that is, you know, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can an evil tree bring forth good fruit. Jesus Christ was a very good tree. He brought forth good fruits. And you can see, based on his works, based on everything that he did, that he was of God. Verse 37, it says, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. He's explaining, you guys aren't even saved. You don't believe God. You haven't seen him. You don't know him. You don't have his word abiding in you. And the reason why he knows that is because God sent Jesus Christ and they didn't believe Jesus. If they had God's word abiding in them, if they truly believed that, then they would have accepted Jesus Christ and they would have received what he had to say because what Jesus had to say was from the Father. It was from God. And if they had God's word abiding in them, they would have known that. And here's where, again, we're going to see um, why we don't do this Jew worship because they're not of God. They don't believe in God. Verse number um, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And this is like so many people even today, you know, they think that they're, they're trusting the Bible, right? The, the Jews at that time, they had the scriptures. They had the prophets. They had Isaiah. They had the book of Moses. They had... The scriptures, and Jesus says, 
Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. You think you're saved based on what the Bible says. And there's so many people today, they think they're saved based on what the Bible says. They think they're saved because they've been baptized. They think they're saved because of all this. And then they'll point to the Bible to support that, right? Just like the Pharisees. They thought they were saved because of their righteousness that couldn't be further from the truth. He says, and they are they which testify of me. He said, the very scriptures that you're supposedly trusting in, that you think is giving you eternal life, are the very scriptures that are talking about Jesus Christ. The very scriptures that a lot of people claim to believe in, that whether it be Mormon, Joy, any cult or any false denomination, or anybody who's just not even saved, that claims to believe in the Bible, that think their works are good enough, the very scriptures that they would rely on are the ones that testify against them, saying that it's by grace through faith alone, it's not of works. All these things are found, every concept, all these things are found throughout the entire Bible, the truth of God's word. Yet, some people are just blinded and they can't get that. And Jesus is trying to get this through to these people. It's important for us to get that too, that we don't leave that part out. And I try not to do that either when I'm talking to someone that isn't getting saved at the door. You know, it's not trying to be rude or mean, but if it's someone who claims to believe the Bible, I'll try to show them the scriptures and say, you know, this is what you say you believe, but this is what it's saying that's different than what you believe. And um, they need to hear that. That's what Jesus Christ was explaining to the Pharisees here. He says in verse 40, And ye will not come to me that you might have life. Have to come to Jesus Christ for that life. It's not going to come any other way. It's not going to come through your good life. It's not going to come through the works of the law. He says you have to come to me, and you won't do it. You refuse to do it. Verse number forty-one: I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I have now. Did a lot of people think they love God? And probably on the outward, they looked. You know, these Pharisees. They they dress the part. They they talk the talk. But they didn't have the love of God. Verse 43, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? He's saying, you guys, you know, you basically the respecter of persons, they'll receive honor from other men and other Pharisees and everything else, but they're not seeking the honor from God. They're not trying to do things God's way. They're more worried about what other men think and receiving the honor of men. Verse 45, we're almost done. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. They thought they believed in Moses' law. They were, they were like, no, we believe Moses. You know, but as for this man, we know not where he came. But we know, you know, they, they, they really like to, to stick and cling to Moses. But he's saying that, he said, I'm not even going to have to accuse you to the Father. Because if you're going to trust in Moses and in his law to be saved, Moses himself will testify against you. You haven't kept the law. You are not perfect. You are lost and you need salvation. And that's what he was preaching unto him here, that Moses is going to accuse him to the Father. Because they didn't keep the law that he had written down for him, yet they claimed to believe that. And it says in verse 46, for had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? And we'll close with this point. People today will like to think, oh, well, the Jews, they just believe the Old Testament. They don't believe the New Testament, you know. They need to get that part right, but they believe the Old Testament. Do they really believe it? Do they really believe Moses' law? According to Jesus Christ himself, according to the word of Jesus Christ, they did not believe Moses' law. They did not believe it. They claimed to. They claimed to. They said, that's who you're going to. You, know, you think you believe in the law. That's what you're trusting in for eternal life. But they didn't believe it. Jesus said, for had you believed Moses, if you would have really believed what he said, you would also believe me. Because, why? Because they're both, it's both coming from God. It's God's word. God doesn't contradict himself. Moses spake of me. It says, for he wrote of me. The things that Moses wrote in the Bible, he wrote about Jesus Christ. So if you were believing what Moses wrote, then there's no reason why you wouldn't believe Jesus Christ because it's one and the same. He wrote of Jesus. 
And this last verse is important. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? It's easy for us to think, it's, it's, it's hard for us to understand sometimes, how can people not get saved when Jesus Christ is literally walking around on this earth? How can that happen? And people will point to the millennial reign of Christ. Because in the millennium, after the rapture, after the resurrection, after the great tribulation, and after God pours out his wrath, after all those events, when we're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, there are still going to be nations and people who are unsaved. And God is going to be reigning, and we're going to be reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ for those 1,000 years. But not everybody on the earth is going to be saved. Some people are going to be unsaved because at the end of that reign, Satan's going to be loosed for a season. He's going to go and deceive the people and bring them together at the, you know, at the last days of the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to bring, you know, Satan's going to bring these people, and God's just going to destroy them all in an instant with fire. He's going to burn them. It's not even going to be a battle. They're just all going to be gone. But people will say, well, how can there still be people unsaved on this earth when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning? Well, how can people be unsaved when Jesus Christ walked this earth and was performing miracles and raising people from the dead? Same reason, right? It's the same thing that's going to be. For people just have in their hearts, people have wicked hearts sometimes, they just don't want to accept the truth, they just don't want to believe it. And he says, look, if you didn't believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? We need to have that faith. Even, even if faith, you know, even if Jesus Christ is standing in front of you, not everyone's going to believe him. But you still can believe through his word, through what he said. And this is what's going to save. And it's his words. But um, even when he's here, not everyone is going to believe that. But um, he's saying, if you don't even believe what the scripture says, and that's where a lot of people, you know, I doubt salvation. When I talk to people individually, and we're, we're having discussions about the Bible, and they're not getting anything, and they'll say, like, if you could, if, when people could just point at the Bible and just be like, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think that their faith is on Christ. Because if they don't believe these writings, how they shall believe his words. And you say, well, I believe in, because people say this, and I've heard this before. People say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I, but I don't believe in all those, you know, in, in everything that's in the Bible. I mean, I don't believe all this other stuff. You know, I believe in evolution. I, I don't believe that there was really a flood. I think it was all the story. I don't believe that. They're not believing the word. Jesus Christ is the word. That makes me think that person is not saved. When someone's not believing Moses' writings, how are they going to believe Jesus Christ's words on getting saved? It's one and the same. It's the same message. It's the same God. Jesus Christ is the word. As far as I word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for this chapter, dear God. Uh, there's so much deep doctrine here, Lord. I, I pray that, that um, you help us all just to continue to grow and understand your words more and more. God, I pray that you please help us to have the answers to defend the faith. And uh, when people have, have questions about the hope that's in us, dear Lord, help us help us to be able to give good answers. God, I pray that you please use us, bless us, bless this church, help us to win many souls to Christ, dear Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.